In other words, that de devastation and complete destruction of the socialist movement and of the left has already happened. And that's why Marxists for the last hundred years have been forced against their will, against their intentions to just be rationalizers for progressive liberalism. The death of God is about the drying up of a horizon of meaning and of a whole form of human life. Where do we stand in the illusion it makes? What kind of space are we invited into? The material relations between people become social relations between things. When we look at toasters, corn, and TVs, we don't we see We still, to a large extent, live in the interregnum between so between worlds, if you will, or between paradigms. Not many people in the history of the world have faced that. Diet Soap is a sublation media podcast. Regular here on the Diet Soap podcast, and uh, I, I'm going to say is an ally to sublation media. Um, I've asked him to come on the channel today to talk about a, a presidential address he gave to the platypus affiliated society in 2015 and it was called how is platypus a pre-political project but i think it might be retitled how is the left in a pre-political moment yes um and i feel today very much as if i am in a pre-political moment um and as russia has invaded the ukraine and i do look around and look inside my own head for a response and don't find one. Um, it, it, I, I know that the, there's a split on the left right now between the anti-imperialist left who are pro-Putin, pro -Putin, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. then there's uh, the rest of the left, which is wrestling with how, how to support Ukraine, whether or not to support uh, U.S. sanctions, uh, whether or not to send money to the Ukraine to buy weapons. Um, so if I could say something about this, you know, mm -hmm. it does feel a little bit like coming full circle to the anti-war movement mm -hmm. during which platypus originated, during which my students approached me to start the extracurricular reading group that had such a fateful <laughs> purpose in mm -hmm. terms of platypus. And, you know, my point back then would be the same point now, which is to say that the left such as it is, and of course, I think the left is dead as a political force. Mm -hmm. So it's just sort of bloviating opinionation, right? It, it neither has the duty, nor does it have the right to take a position on these things, because mm -hmm. we're in not in any position to affect things, right? So it's just about like a kind of moralizing about how we should feel and how we should think. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's pretty straightforward. War is awful. And, you know, we should feel badly, you know, we should feel bad about it, about the war. And, um, you know, we should be impressed by the tragedy of it. And of course, you know, it's a crime. And just as in the war on terror, there are plenty of criminals, mm -hmm. right? So it's a crime and there are many culpable parties. And, uh, you know, what I would say straight off the bat is that, of course, the United States as the, you know, leading capitalist country and as the global state, because it really is. Of course, the U.S., therefore, has a greater share of responsibility, of culpability. Mm -hmm. But you could say, you know, the police have greater culpability than the gangs mm -hmm. in terms of conditions of crime. Right. Right. Um, especially because, you know, much of the time there's, there's, you know, a modus vivendi and there's, um, you know, collusion, right? In other words, uh, you know, I'll always remember what Foucault says, you know, uh, the police don't stop crime, they manage it, mm -hmm. right? So the U.S. doesn't stop global chaos and political degeneration wars but the U.S. tries to manage them. And in trying to manage them, of course, the U.S. becomes culpable in them. Mm -hmm. Right. So, you know, the whole the whole issue of like who's who's responsible, you know, the old Fred Halliday question at the time of the war on terror, who's responsible? 
um, you know, yeah, Al Qaeda brought down the World Trade Center, but didn't the U.S. fund Al Qaeda against the Soviet Union in Afghanistan? Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, does that mean that the U.S. is, you know, responsible for Al Qaeda in all of its actions? In one sense, yes. In another sense, of course, no. Mm -hmm. Right. So it's just one of these things. And the left is just sort of there. Now, what I would say, you know, straight away and the pre-political moment. It's the post-political moment, right? Meaning like you and I are of Generation X. Mm -hmm. And so we are the post-political generation. And what that means is we're the generation that comes after the new left. Now, the new left wasn't terribly political either. But side taking on these issues is really about trying to figure out which wing of capitalist politics one wants to get behind. Mm -hmm. Right. And not just in terms of Russia and the United States or broad, more broadly, NATO versus Russia, but within NATO and within the United States, you know, these, this kind of a crisis is going to be used opportunistically to score points and, you know, and to, uh, you know, try to assign blame and take political advantage. Mm -hmm. Right. So the Democrats are there to say, well, you know, Trump set this up by, you know, flattering Putin and encouraging him. And of course, the Trump Republicans can say, well, you know, Putin didn't act under Trump. He last acted in this way. He sees the Crimea under Obama. And now that Biden's back, Putin saw an opportunity to do the same thing that he was able to get away with with the previous administration, especially because Biden's evidently weak. And because all the all the personnel are second string Obama people. Mm -hmm. So they're even less competent than the Obama people were, who were pretty incompetent, um, including, of course, Hillary on Libya mm -hmm. and Syria. Um, and so, you know, war is politics by other means, right? Von Clausewitz, mm -hmm. who, mm -hmm. you know, I think Lenin quoted and sometimes the left will, you know, uh, mistake the spirit in which Lenin quoted von Clausewitz on this point. Mm -hmm. um, you know, war is politics by other means in capitalism, but that just shows how wretched capitalism is. Right. Right. And, uh, you know, the dream of European peace has been there since the end of the Napoleonic Wars, since the Battle of Waterloo. Right. Right. Um, and of course, it was very dramatic and drastic when that peace was broken. You know, there was a Crimean War, mm -hmm. and then there was a, you know, Franco Prussian War, and then of course, there's World War One and World War Two. Right. But so I just think, <clears throat> you know, what are we talking about here? And I would say it remains post political, meaning in the absence of the possibility of a struggle for socialism, we should expect wars, mm -hmm. you know, uh, because capitalism generates crises, including political crises that can result in war. Not, not because, you know, there's like an arms industry and whatnot, because the arms industry makes money whether or not there's a war. Mm -hmm. Right. So that's mm -hmm. not a reason. The, the reason that there's war is not because there's an arms industry. Not at all. Yeah, right. Right. And so that that whole argument is just bullshit, too. You know, so but, you know, again, you know, Putin's a criminal. He is. Um, no doubt. Right. Mm -hmm. um, in a particular way, you mean meaning he's an irresponsible actor. You know, he's an authoritarian despot of a, of a marginal country. Mm -hmm. And I think he acts out of weakness not out mm -hmm. of strength and in such a position of weakness of course one of the things one of the only things that weak people have is force mm -hmm. right. right so you know it's a constant temptation for weak 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 governments weak politicians to use force right and you know i mean you know no doubt you know nato and biden and these people you know, are, are shocked and appalled, you know, by this. Um, it also, though, confirms their worldview in a particular way. And they kind of set it up. You know, you just think of being Putin, right? And mm -hmm. I, I watched the Oliver Stone interviews with Putin. Mm -hmm. And they were interesting. 
you know, what, what Putin said to Oliver Stone, and Oliver Stone is a little bit of a peacenik, you know, kind of Vietnam veteran, kind of anti-war mm-hmm. kind of guy, mm-hmm. you know, kind of anti-Cold War kind of guy. There's a chance, by the way, that I might get the ch- a chance to interview Oliver Stone. Oh, I'm you should. See if, you should. Yeah. I mean, we, we, we've spoken to him. Platypus people have spoken to him, and we wanted to interview him, and he, he recommended that we interview his, um, is it Peter Kuznick, who's the co-author of the um, Untold History of the United States? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, around that project because mm-hmm. it's an interesting project, but you know, you, you you certainly should. But so what? What Putin told Oliver Stone was that the United States cannot rule the world, although since it's the preeminent power, it seeks to world, rule the world. Mm-hmm. It cannot rule the world, and therefore it should not try, and it should let countries like Russia and China rule their own neighborhoods, right? Because the U.S. actually can't rule the world. It will try to. That's you know, he, he thought it's a natural temptation mm-hmm. that the U.S. will try to rule the world the way the British did. Mm-hmm. But the British failed to do so and got into conflicts with Russia until it figured out that it should be an ally of Russia. Right. Right, and that's what he was saying. He was saying the U.S. should really be an ally of Russia and China in order to help keep order in these areas that the U.S. can't actually keep order in the former Soviet sphere in Central Asia, right? It yeah. Actually, yeah. So I had a conversation you know, yesterday with- It's realism, um, it's realism. Yeah. yeah, I had a conversation yesterday with them. Um, it's not really realism though, right? But well, I'll get back, I'll get back to that. realism in, if you leave aside the whole question of capitalism. Right. Then yeah. it's realism. It's a, but it's right back to that old dream of a peaceful Europe is what it is. It's, it's mm-hmm. a re-expression of that dream. Mm-hmm. Um, but mm-hmm. one where they're say, basically saying, you want this peaceful coexistence and give us power is what Putin is saying. Get out of our. Or just allow stuff. them. Yeah. Just right. Them. Yeah. yeah. And, and um, I had a conversation with the, uh, some humanists at the news and letters, like, you know, uh-huh. my old background of uh, uh-huh, uh, uh-huh. The Marxist humanists. Mm-hmm. And they were talking about um, Putin and uh, uh, you know, vilifying him and is in a way that wasn't inappropriate it wasn't inappropriate right but it um he's a villain yeah he is a villain absolutely so but on the other hand it didn't seem to be particularly helpful it wasn't as deep as their analysis of hegel right we've been talking about hegel no, it's, and super, and, it's superficial you know so you know when we say that putin's a villain i'm reminded of what trump said which, which is, is that we're killers too Right, exactly. Well, that's what I ended up saying to them. It's like they were talking about the authoritarian uh, nature of Russian state. And I said, look, we should see this as a continuity and not as a discontinuity because we've been living under the increasingly authoritarian regimes in the United States since at least the attacks of September 11th, uh, you know, with the, the disappearance of habeas corpus and the, the invention of, you know, the construction of a surveillance. Yeah, but since yeah, but I said at least since the Palmer raids, yeah, yeah, of course. But since yeah. Woodrow Wilson, I mean, since Woodrow yeah. Wilson sent Eugene Debs to jail, it's right. been pretty fucking authoritarian. Goes up and down, but yeah, it's it, it since it certainly in the last twenty years. Well, I mean, it's true that um, is it Warren Harding who came in after Woodrow Wilson? He let Debs out of jail, and he mm-hmm. loosened up, loosened up. But back right. then, you know, the Republicans were the liberals, right? Right. And, you know, but once you get into like, you know, World War II is pretty repressive. You know, they they, Mm -hmm. you know, they clamped down on Trotskyists who were Mm -hmm. against the war. And that's what the news and letters people remember. They remember then. Right. Um, And, you know, because the Trotskyists tried to maintain a kind of revolutionary defeatist line in World War II, as had Mm -hmm. been the Marxist. Well, or at least the revolutionary Marxist position in World War One. Mm. And so they do recall that. They do remember that. And, uh, you know, people like James Hartfield, who you've published, you know, mm. Unpatriotic History of World War II. Is that right? I don't think that um, I didn't publish that. It may have been published by the team before me. But uh, uh-huh. but so he yeah. has this, you know, um, you know, kind of British preoccupation with being anti-British patriotic and against the mm. poppies, you know, mm-hmm, that mm-hmm. kind of memory of World War One. And, you know, basically saying all sides in World War One and all sides in World War II were imperialist. Mm-hmm. And well, I, I, I want to get to the point what, that I said to the news and letter people, which is that yep. um, they were saying, oh, he wants to make Russia great again. 
Putin does, right? That's uh, that that was their line, and I said, and I, I thought about that, and I thought about, I, I don't think I, maybe I didn't even mention this to them at the time, but I thought about how Trump had said, "Great, make America great again." And in one of your uh, lectures, you pointed out that Trump might also have said, "Make Mexico great again." He did. Make, he not make, only make, that, he made um, what's his name, and I always forget this guy's name. His first attorney general, Jeff mm -hmm. Sessions. He made Jeff Sessions and Rudy Giuliani go down to Mexico and wear hats that said, make Mexico great again. Right. So, I mean, ultimately, the dream of making Russia great, China great, Mexico great, is a dream of uh, a well-managed capitalist yes. society. It's not, it's not nationalism. It's a well-managed international system. That's what it is. Right. right. You don't want any failed states. Right. Yeah. And uh, so, and it's really a dream that I think both parties share. Oh, Republicans and Democrats. Mm -hmm. Yeah. For real, for real. I mean, so let's, I guess let's cut to the chase about the war stuff, right? Because mm -hmm. I do want to talk about other things. I do want to yeah. talk about more grand historical horizons. Yeah. So war is kind of pseudo politics, meaning, you know, it's, it's a, I think that Zizek wrote something about, the Yugoslav war against the double blackmail, mm -hmm. um, you know, very famously, you know, saying, don't, don't fall for it. You know, don't fall for the double blackmail, um, you know, in terms of taking sides in the Yugoslav war, in the NATO mm -hmm. war in Yugoslavia, mm -hmm. and then later in Kosovo. Um, and, you know, and of course, in those instances, it can be shown that NATO did in fact instigate, or at least helped pave the way for the breakup the, the violent breakup of Yugoslavia. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I do think that it's a pseudo politics, meaning that it's it, it because we think that politics is like passionate feeling and, you know, impassioned opinion and taking a side. We think politics is like that. It's like taking a side. Mm -hmm. Right. And it goes back to the 30s. It goes back to the Stalinists. It does. Uh, which side are you on? Comrade, mm -hmm. which side are you on? It's a blackmail. It is a blackmail. It's a moral blackmail that is pseudo politics. It's the height of pseudo politics because mm -hmm. politics has to be not based on morality. Mm -hmm. It can't be based on this moral blackmail. It cannot, right? Because in capitalism, you know, politics is not the arena of justice. Right. It is not, right? It's not going to be. And even the struggle for socialism is ultimately not going to be about justice. It might be motivated by certain impulses and desires for justice, but it's not really about that. It's about freedom. Mm -hmm. And of course, that's the difficult part. So, you know, I think that coming full circle, you know, platypus, we started out in the context of the anti-war movement and the war on terror is now being relegated to a footnote in history, by the way. It mm -hmm. really is. Um, but it seemed like the end of the world, um, you know, the RCP, you know, had this kind of growly like um, demagogy at the at anti-war protests. Mm -hmm. Bush is preparing for a thousand years of fascism. <laughs> right. 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 And I just thought if only that were true. Right. Then it would it would give these things a kind of significance that they don't have. Mm -hmm. They simply do not have. So it's pseudo politics and the left tries to recruit out of these things out of mm -hmm. the fear and passions of young people mm -hmm. who don't know any better, right? So a war comes along every once in a while, just in time for a new generation of people who don't remember the last war to be impressed by the reality of the new war. Mm -hmm. And the left is going to say, if you really oppose war, then you should join our group because we're the socialists, you know, we're the real ones or the communists, you know, with the RCP. And or we're the Marxists and, and only Marxism really understands why war is going to happen and only socialism can prevent war. Right. Which is all true, by the way. It's true <laughs> only in the most empty sense. Right. And it's just like, look, we are a long ways off from achieving socialism. So Marxism's explanation for why war happens is pretty much fucking useless. Mm. Like what 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 good does it do you? Right. And also, especially because the Marxist explanations are bullshit anyway, like economic interests and this and that. No, 
war is a political failure, right? And there are deep reasons in capitalism for war, but it's not economic interest because war almost never serves any economic interest. Some people get rich off of it, but it's a net loss economically. It's not like a boon economically. In general. Well, wait, wait, I'm just going to interject and say, when you are engaged in the, in the game of capitalism, uh -huh. there are times when you have to have, suffer a net loss in order to be able to be productive and get back to profitability. That's not why they dominate. do it, though. That might be true in, in the end because yeah. every destruction is an opportunity for capitalism to rebuild right. itself. <laughs> But in the meantime, the costs are not worth it. I mean, after World War II, the United States came out on top economically as the winners of that war. After in World War I, Doug, this is really important. It's after right. World War I because the, the West, the Entente, Britain, Britain and France and Russia, they indebted themselves, themselves to the United States. And so mm -hmm. the, the U.S. replaced the British after World War I. That's how it happened. Mm, okay. And then they failed to assert that global rule, right? Mm -hmm. Because of isolationism, they didn't join the League of Nations, they didn't pass like Wilson's, you know, um, Treaty of Versailles, because the Republicans were very skeptical, as they should have been. Again, mm -hmm. they were the progressive liberals at the time, very mm -hmm. skeptical about this this plan of Woodrow Wilson to establish a world peace, the League of Nations. If that had been established, and if it included countries that it ultimately didn't include, like the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. and then maybe, you know, I guess something could have happened differently, perhaps, probably not, because the Great Depression really wrecked the Yeah, I was going to say that, yeah. And it wrecked the, um, the cycle of debt, you know, where the Germans paid the British and the French, and the British and the French paid the Americans their debt. And the U.S. floated loans to Germany to pay their debt to Britain and France so they could pay the United States, right? Right. I mean, look, here's what I would say about Marx's explanation that on a political economic level. It's like just because he says things are economically motivated doesn't mean that he thinks there are clear-cut winners or that the wars will succeed. But just that you, you set up these oppositions between nations that are based on control of resources and, and you product create productivity. Competition. and competition. And the impoverishment of the working classes in other nations. Absolutely. Okay, so all these you conflicts arise from ultimately competition within the working class, right. whether within nations or between nations, because there's a global working class. That's right. the Marxist position. Right. There's a world working class, and the crises of capitalism, the contradictions of capitalism, and the uneven development of capitalism, which really just means the contradictory development of capitalism creates competition and it does create a kind of a race to the bottom with respect to wages it does do that mm -hmm. um and which which creates a need for increased profitability which has its own sort of brutalizing logic mm. um all that i'm saying is that the marxist explanation the, that you get from the sectarian left and from general public discourse on the left okay is 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 poor it's not even marxist really okay you know it's like well, that i agree with yeah, yeah pseudo marxism and you know and it's a mediated phenomenon in other words we have to be careful about a kind of right hegelian a kind of affirmative view where marxism is going to explain why everything happens which pretty much becomes an apologetics for whatever happens mm. right where mm. it's like oh well this was bound to happen because of x y and z it's like well no there is political agency there is, you know, political subjectivity. There are criminals. They should be held accountable, right? Otherwise, mm -hmm. it's going to be like, well, they were bound to act that way. And it's like, well, then what are we talking about? Right, right. Uh, we may have to go over my first allotted time here because there's stuff I want to talk about uh, other than this war, but the war That's is right. so big. But, but let's just stay with, with the first. It's not big, meaning right. it might be over before we know it, right? Right. It might be, um, you know, war is politics by other means, meaning that it's negotiation through force. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's ultimately what Putin is trying to do. He's trying to achieve on the battlefield what he couldn't achieve on the negotiating table mm -hmm. with, with the United States and with NATO. Um, and it will be negotiated. I mean, obviously, they're going to come back to some modus vivendi, 
right? Like they are right. going to come back to some it's, way of. It's a big them. game of chicken, is what it is right now. I mean, that's what makes it dangerous, right? Yeah, because you know you could you could make a mistake, you could fuck up. But my point about post politics and pseudo politics is that taking a position on the war is not the left's politics. Right. What it is is the left preventing itself from having a politics because once you take a position on the war, you're ceding. You're advocating okay. to the capitalist politics. I'm seeing a path back into the conversation I wanted to have with you, which Good. is about this um, uh, presidential uh, speech that you gave in 2015. And at that time, before Bernie and Trump, right before, before right before it was, it was uh, on the day that Hillary Clinton uh, announced that she was running for president, yep. I believe. And, um, so what you said there was, you had a bunch of different figures on the left, as you always do at these platypus conventions, come in and speak. And you had had a conversation with someone from the Bolshevik tendency, the international Bol Bolshevik. I think tendency. Tom Riley, yeah. Tom Riley. And Tom Riley had accused you and, um, Richard Rubin of, of breaking from the sparks back in 1992, I think because you disagreed with their revolutionary defeatist anti-imperialist stance. Oh, right, and, right. And that you said, so yeah, and you said, no, I, I, I didn't at the time. That was not why I, I broke from them. Because the Gulf War. The, the, Bill Clinton, right, there was a Gulf War. It was the Gulf War, which, by the way, I was, that's formative for me, the, the Gulf War was. Yeah, I was anti-war. I was out there. I was yeah, me too. horrified. And, you know, the Spartacist position was sink U.S. imperialism in the Persian Gulf. <clears throat> mm -hmm. And, you know, they had high hopes that the Soviet Union would rescue Saddam Hussein. Right. And, you know, that the U.S. would be defeated militarily. And I didn't really think that that was going to happen. But I remember having conversations. I was a Hampshire College student with mm. other Hampshire College students who, you know, we had events about this on campus. Mm. And they said, well, is it the case that the enemy of my enemy is my friend? And I said, well, no. Right. But it can certainly sound like that. Right. Right. And but there are circumstances in which the enemy of my enemy is my friend in capitalist politics, meaning Certainly, the Republicans want this war right now in the Ukraine to go as badly as possible for the U.S. and NATO in order to be able to use it against the Democrats. There <laughs> are defeatists in the ruling class. They yeah, and there are lots of, a lots of people on the left who feel the same way as the Republicans. They do. And, they and I want to admit it. Yeah, but yeah. And there and, are some Democrats also who are defeatists because they want to defeat their opponents within the Democratic Party. And of course, within the Republican Party, there are different sides too. Mm -hmm. It's capitalist defeatism though. It's not revolutionary defeatism. I, uh, right. I, I remember in, in the second, uh, around the second uh, war in Iraq. And they're even more unscrupulous than the left is. In other words, they really do want to see body bags. Like they, they these are gangsters. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I had a conversation. I didn't really have a left milieu that I was a part of especially after I, I left the Portland Peaceful Response Coalition uh, in disgust. So I, I was going to like a block party and just hang out with some friends. And I was a couple of beers in, and it came to me that what I really wanted was for America to lose badly in Iraq, for us to just have our nose bloodied and be sent home. I guess in body bags, I felt this terrible is, um, about that. This is under George Herbert Walker Bush. Yeah, right. Yeah. And I, and I told my friend, I said, Iranism, listen, yeah. I looked at him and I was like a madman. I was raving. And I was like, we have to lose. America has to lose. We have to. And, and, and it's like, Doug, what, 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 I didn't know I had such a radically communist Stalinist friend. Uh, you know, it's like, a political, I mean, look again, a socialist politics would aim at something else. Right. But my point was that exactly that. Ultimately, even though at the time you didn't break from the Sparks because you disagreed with their line, your Tom Riley was right. Your being demoralized by the election of Clinton, yes, was ultimately a disagreement with the Spartacus line. Oh no, they were very anti-Clinton as well, you know. Uh, well, I know, but being anti-Clinton is not very... the same thing as being demoralized by yes. the anti-imperialist. Uh, logic yep. of the Sparks. Oh, sure, because um, exactly. In other words, um, well, the Spartacists. I always felt like 
I understood their position better than they did. Mm -hmm. And that was arrogant of me, of course. I was very young. But I probably knew something, right? And, mm -hmm. and certainly they knew more about the history of the left. You were willing to say things about their position that they weren't willing to say. Right. Right. And so that's why they never trusted me. Exactly. Right. And so, but you know, they themselves, look, where did I learn this from? I actually learned it from them, that there's a difference between bourgeois defeatism and socialist defeatism revolutionary right. defeatism and capitalist defeatism and that the apparent defeatism of the left is actually just pro-democrat or it could be pro-republican too in a way that they would not understand or see mm -hmm. right and um you know certainly look a real socialist left would try to take advantage of divisions among the ruling class of course it would mm -hmm. right but it would still point out how rotten and unprincipled the apparent pacifism and defeatism of members of the ruling class is mm -hmm. right so again it's we're in the realm of pseudo politics so maybe we could use this as a definition what's politics the class struggle right. the struggle for socialism anything but that is pseudo politics right yeah right? So, I mean, in other words, you know, Marxism, like that's what politics is. It's the class struggle, which means the struggle for socialism, not just some grubby racketeering of the working class to get more crumbs. Right. But a struggle for power, political power, mm -hmm. real political power, not just mm -hmm. in this or that country either. Right. 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 So, again, it's kind of like, what are we talking about? You know, it's like politics what it means to say that it, we're in a post-political moment now we're in a post-political moment now because of the collapse of the bernie hopes and the dsa like mm -hmm. you know baskar sankara just became president of the nation yeah the, i and remember that, that, that natural, back in the day back in the day there were criticisms of jacobin saying i can, i'm beginning not to be able to tell the difference between jacobin and the nation I was just and, talking with Spencer Leonard about this. We were trying to recall the nation back in the day when we were reading it as young people. And they had regular columns by Christopher Hitchens and mm -hmm. Alexander Coburn and Adolf Reed, all mm -hmm. leftists, all socialists, all Marxists, mm -hmm. all ex Trotskyists. Mm -hmm. What the hell were they doing publishing in the nation? The nation's not Trotskyist, it's not socialist, it's not Marxist, right? This means nothing different. In, in other words, it's a natural, natural generational succession for Bhaskar to take over the nation. It's his destiny. It always was his destiny. And if I do say so myself, I always said so. <laughs> Within Platypus, I always said, what's going to happen with Bhaskar is that he's going to end up being the editor of Nation magazine. Right. Right. And that's what this is all about. That's what it's all about. Now, the post-political moment in terms of the death of the millennial left and their aspirations, their delusions, because I think DSA Jacobin were super cynical, super cynical about Bernie. Jacobin predates Bernie. Mm -hmm. And I think that for them, Bernie is just a confirmation of what they want to do anyway. And so it's not really about Bernie winning the Democratic primary or Bernie really taking over, you know, the Democratic Party or let alone winning the presidency. It's about having a new generation of Bernie's, which is what AOC and the squad are, mm. right? It's just going to continue. The same mm. shit's going to continue. And that's going to justify the DSA's position um, from back in the 1980s when they started under Reagan. And, you know, they didn't expect, nor did they really desire anything really to change. They just wanted to renew the same old thing, the same old Harrington 1980s we talk about defeatism you know harrington on the dsa he accepted this as like the best you can do under very poor circumstances and it wasn't meant for harrington to be an end in itself it certainly has become an end in itself and now it definitely is going to be an end in itself right i i when i was part of the peace movement in the in the early aughts um I had a conversation with uh, uh, another friend again over beers, and uh, he was saying that we should look realistically at the situation in Iraq 
and make a call for full occupation rather than this halfway measure because of the, it was going to lead to more bloodshed and and you know the Storm way and Norman we... Schwarzkopf wanted to go all the way to Baghdad. Right. And and um my friend who was not really a leftist but was a part of the peace coalition, right? Yep. He was saying that kind of thing. And I said, "No, no, no. You don't understand what our role is. Our role is not to come up with policy yeah. capitalists. Our role is to moderate them." to be a mitigating force against their impulses, to say, if you do this, there will be consequences. So we go to the maximal position. You withdraw now. Withdraw mm -hmm. now. Mm -hmm. And that will actually hold them back from being as brutal as they might be. Uh, that was my idea. But I mean, that look, idea is... brutality and there's brutality, meaning... Well, I'm not, I'm, not, I, I'm not advocating that position now. No, no, my no, point, I know. But it's, I, my, it's... my point is that I was accepting that the left's role was this sort of permanent, like let's it was just, just mold, another let's, institution. Let's mull this over, though. In other words, if if the basic impulse is pacifistic, right, which we you know must admit is the case, right, um, then what we should really want is for wars to be won very quickly. In other words, right. really, what we should have wanted was Saddam Hussein to surrender to the United States or Ukraine to surrender to Putin. Done. Which, by the way. That's what Kuba said at the end of the last podcast that I just did on Ukraine. He was like, what I hope for is that Zelensky surrenders. Quick surrender. Quick yeah. surrender. Yep. Mm -hmm. Stop the bloodshed. That's right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I mean, that's why I said, you know, I think we had an interview where I, I said that, you know, um, about Afghanistan and the Taliban and turning over, you know, Osama bin Laden. The U.S. might not have might not have invaded Afghanistan if that had happened. The thing is, could the Taliban have done that, right? Or would they have undermined themselves? Would Al Qaeda have allowed that? In other words, would Al Qaeda have tried to overthrow the Taliban if they had tried to do that? Maybe, and then maybe the U.S. would have gone in anyway because you would have had a failed state. You would have had some kind of humanitarian disaster, and then some international peacekeepers have to come in. Mm -hmm. and, you know, Putin uses this language. He's like, you know, Russian forces are entering as peacekeepers. Mm -hmm. Of course they are. That's what every military is doing, right? Mm -hmm. It's basically saying that the opposing government has, as you know, abdicated, you know, and that they're going to replace them. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically that's it. So, you know, again, if we keep in mind that war is an expression of political failure in capitalism mm -hmm. and that, you know, politics is international. In other words, every state is actually based on neighboring states and based on the global state, right? Because every state is only a state, a nation state by virtue of, you know, maintaining itself vis-a-vis -vis the other states. So they're all mm -hmm. kind of maintaining each other, mm -hmm. including through confrontation. Right? Mm -hmm. It's a modus vivendi. And so, you know, but again, it's kind of like, should but from a defeatist from a capitalist defeatist standpoint from a bourgeois defeatist standpoint of course you want the war to go as disastrously as possible in other words like dissidents in russia i'm sure would like putin's invasion to go as badly as possible which means probably with the most ukrainians dying let's be right in other words like yes with the most russians dying but in order for that to happen probably many more ukrainians will have to die Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. What do you make of the fact that the Russian dissidents, the peace movement there has picked up the slogan from 2003? I mean, maybe it goes before that, but uh -huh. not, in my, not in our name. Oh, it's I nice. Mean, I, I, mean, it's, I thought, did know. Bob Avakian like immigrate? Well, is yeah, he over look, there? I mean, I am, of course, heartened by the fact that there is an anti-war movement in Russia. Me of too. course. Right? right. That's great. Um. I would also be heartened, you know, it's not something that you get easy access to by there being a, an opposition within the Ukraine against Zelensky's government. You right. know, would it be a pro-Russian opposition? Maybe. Right. But but an opposition that would blame the, the, the Zelensky government for what's going on. I mean, look, in terms of the lead up to the war, um, the breakaway republics, the Russian majority um, provinces of mm. Eastern U Ukraine, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Ukraine did not accept 
their claims to autonomy and there was a low level war going on the whole time right. and that has been painted as like ukrainian resistance against russian aggression but isn't it ukrainian aggression isn't mm -hmm. it you know yeah. in other words if you get into like who started it it's a kind of endless imponderable thing you could say there's an argument that both sides started it or either side started it so that's also not going to really work you know yeah, well, last night I watched uh, Zelensky's uh, television series, uh, Servant of the People. Oh, you mean uh, comedy? Yeah, it was... Oh, a... where he runs for president as a comedian. And as he doesn't even president. run. He doesn't oh. run. It's post-political, Chris. Uh-huh, uh-huh. He, he accidentally makes a viral video and gets elected to the presidency to, against his will. And yeah, that's Zelensky episode one. himself might be okay. Right. But of course, it's not just him. It's the party and the parties that support him and whatever, you know, like I, I really don't. Well, know I have no opinion about Zelensky, the man, but Zelensky, right. the phenomenon is really interesting. And but I, I want to like, OK, that's a shiny object I could get distracted by. Right. <laughs> but so let's go back to the political post political. Yeah, political. let's go back to the post political, because I want to ask you a question. You mentioned Bashkar, Jacobin, uh, obviously ending up as a nation. I don't think that sublation has any chance of going on that trajectory i think but i think we do have some yeah, risks of course you that... do imagine if this were to happen right okay. so let's say that you know you doug lane are you know impresario i'm too uh, old to end up to be the next president of jacob and i'm 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 51 but someone else one of our other people at, at sublation well Park. but what i'm saying is let's say that there's a massive calamity like a an asteroid hits the earth and a lot of people die but not everybody dies and people are picking up out of the ruins and you know there's some remnant of the democratic party and some remnant of the republican party and there's some like remnant of like progressive liberalism versus conservative liberalism but you know new york and san francisco are destroyed and you know let's just say for good measure chicago is destroyed but you know let's say portland is spared Mm -hmm. then you might be called upon to become the next like i like how they of, for of, me to have a big success the the earth has to be halfway destroyed for this no, to but happen. For, what i'm saying is to replace like progressive liberalism right mm -hmm. to, to replace the personnel in other words you might be forced i mean i feel like i'm often as a marxist mm -hmm. and as like a wannabe socialist uh, maybe even a wannabe Marxist, that I'm forced to make sort of basic liberal points about things. In other words, that really have nothing to do with Marxism or socialism, but are just really mm -hmm. basic points. Mm -hmm. I do too. You know, and so certainly if there was, you know, some devastation such that suddenly there's kind of nobody around except us Marxists, yeah, <laughs> then we might be forced to be the liberals because no one else is doing it. Like, in other words, we might be forced against our will, kicking and screaming to be right. the liberals but this but but we already see that the marxists have been moved and in, moved into the, that position already and that's my point my point is actually that catastrophe has already happened it's called the death of the left <laughs> right okay in other words that de devastation and complete destruction of the socialist movement and of the left has already happened and that's why marxists for the last hundred years have been forced against their will against their intentions to just be rationalizers for progressive liberalism right so how do we avoid that fate at we sublation? may not be able to we might we might rather just recognize the position we're in namely that from a socialist standpoint we're pre-political we're not really political and that what we need to avoid doing is pretending to be something other than we are yeah, I mean, but this sounds like the old, this sounds like the RCP that became spiked to me. This is a very, after 1989, this is the logic of their, of their movement. This is what happened to them. They decided, they retreated into bourgeois enlightenment, the defense of the enlightenment. They tried to stay political, though. In other words, to recognize that it's not political, right? In other words, don't, don't become like the defenders of enlightenment within capitalist politics, because that's never going to work. Right. And anyway, there are a lot of people who can do that already, including right wing people, right? Avowedly right wing people as opposed to supposedly lefty people. Right. Um, or conservative people as opposed to supposed progressive people. 
there are people there to defend like freedom, enlightenment, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, I mean, von Mises, I'm sure, thought he was defending enlightenment, mm -hmm. not right. just defending freedom, but defending enlightenment. And, you know, he might have had a point, mm -hmm. you know, or a kind of Murray Rothbard or whatever, you know. Now, this is where my Frankfurt School stuff comes in. Yeah. Right? Which is to say there is no defending enlightenment in capitalism. Mm. Right. The dialectic of enlightenment. Meaning that there are only fragments and shards of enlightenment. What there is, it is recognition of mystification, recognition of commodity fetishism, rec recognition of the necessity of misrecognition under capitalism. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right. And so we have to be on guard against making unwarranted claims whether in praise or in denunciation of things that will end up affirming things where they need to be critiqued. You know, in other words, I mean, I would say, you know, about the Ukraine stuff and how it is connected to Trump and Brexit, you know, so Brexit and Trump were blamed on the Russians. We might forget mm -hmm. Brexit was blamed on Russian manipulation. Right. And the, of the vote. Right, which is just ridiculous. Well, it was propaganda, Russian propaganda, they really said. They didn't really say the votes were rigged by the Russians. Oh, sure, but the same thing, right? They interfered, right. they meddled, mm -hmm. right? And they, mm -hmm. they, you know, through social media and through bots and influences. But right there, that, that, that very claim should be cast aside because we live in a global society with free speech and as a principle. So, you know what I would say, Doug? So, I'm going to say something truly outrageous. What? Which is, you know, when I decided to go, like, in a sense, all in for Trump, meaning to accept the historical reality of Trump mm -hmm. and to, you know, recognize Trump's significance as not just a sort of aberration and a mistake, mm -hmm. but as an authentic expression of the crisis of neoliberalism and a political expression of the general crisis of capitalism. So, like, you know, 10 years after the Great Recession, basically, mm -hmm. eight years you know, it finally catches up. And Bernie's part of that, too. And mm -hmm. by the way, if Bernie had ever been elected, talk about people blaming Russia for it. They would have oh, yeah. Bernie, too, right? No, they so were already setting the table to do that, yeah. They were already setting the table for that. And so, yeah, because anything anti-Clinton was pro-Russia, mm -hmm. including Bernie. So I was just like, look, what if everything, I think that I've told you this before, what if everything that they say about Trump is true? Let's say that he is a Manchurian candidate kidnapped and reprogrammed by the KGB in 1986 <laughs> under the Soviet Union, and Putin really is a continuity with the old KGB, and he's like pulling the strings, and, you know, like, you know, Trump is just a bot for the Russians, and, and he you know, wins the election and, you know, installs like, you know, some pro Putin regime and, you know, even even establishes fascism and rounds up all the Democrats and all the leftists and puts them in concentration camps and has some like, what is it, Alexander Durgan, mm -hmm. right, sort of like, you know, white nationalist, like some kind of something or other and right, like, fine. Well, you know what? the task of Marxists and socialists remains the same. It remains, mm -hmm. nothing is different, right? In other words, the task of Marxists under the Nazis was no different than under the Weimar Republic. Right, it's it was the to organize the working class yes. uh, to be a political force. Yeah, That's right, and it, it's so mm -hmm. the idea that like, we have to stop this from happening, blah. No, first of all, we can't. And second of all, that's not the task. Right. I mean, there are uh, times where you do something smaller than the ultimate maximum task sure. in order to create conditions for yourself to be able to. But you steer clear. Achieve. In other words, you really steer clear. In other words, the point would not be to organize the working class to be in the vanguard of anti-Trump resistance. No, no. Right. But Which... To the extent that you can have an influence on, let's say, stopping the Nazis from taking power in order to hold on to democratic norms in Germany and therefore be oh, able sure. to organize. Oh, sure. I mean, we could say, look, we could say that the SPD and the Communist Party should have had an alliance to save the Weimar Republic against fascism, I guess. But that would have only been one prong of a larger strategy. Right. Yeah. In other words, really, that would have been just to kind of to paralyze the capitalist state. Right. right, and to prevent it from using the Nazis to prop itself up, 
right? right? So it would have kept some kind of rotten liberal democracy. It might have even supported some like old style conservative, which would have been bad. Mm -hmm. But, you know, but but still, right, it would have been it would have been to prolong the agony of capitalist politics, because after all, the Weimar Republic was pretty fucked up. Right. Right. It's counter revolutionary. It is violent. You know, there were street fighting already between the Nazis and the communists and the socialists mm. already. You know, there's already ethnic communitarian violence going on before the Nazis take power. And, you know, they have their paramilitaries. The SPD and the KPD have their armed workers contingents. They do mm. already. Mm. Right. Mm. Um, so if we're talking about that, sure. Right. Then you might like have an alliance and that alliance, you know, seen from the standpoint of both the SPD and the KPD. Mm -hmm. would have been about fighting each other. In other words, the alliance would have been like a, a better way of like competing with each other. Right. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, of course, not only the KPD, but probably the SPD. I mean, after all, already in 1918 and 1919, the SPD had kind of allied with the fascists against the communists. So mm -hmm. certainly that could have happened again. Mm -hmm. Right. So we have to be careful about this progressive liberal and liberal democratic like vision that it was the communists who sabotaged the Weimar Republic and paved the way for the Nazis, you know, totalitarianism, the horseshoe theory of politics, mm -hmm. the far right and the far left. Mm -hmm. No, 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 absolutely mm -hmm. not. Right. Yeah. So but again, the task remains the same. The task remains the same. And, you know, we have to really disabuse any one of these socialists from this blackmail that we're bound to defend the Democrats as the defenders of liberal democracy, because first of all, the Democrats are not the defenders of liberal democracy, obviously, mm -hmm. any more than the Republicans are any mm -hmm. more than the Republicans are. In other words, if you might make like occasional alliances or something, or find some kind of modus vivendi with capitalist politics, you would have to do it with, any capitalist party, not exclusively with the Democrats. You'd also have to, mm. you know, use the Republicans as well, especially on things like civil liberties, gun rights. Mm -hmm. You'd have to be willing to support, but again, not really support because what you would be doing is you'd be competing with them. You'd be on the same side of an issue. Yeah. Like what we did, what we okay. were trying to do with the trucker convoy by just talking to them. You know, like, I think that the trucker convoy was pretty much completely captured by the conservatives and, and Canada. I, and I don't think that that was a, uh, not so, not convoy. so effectively though. Not, no, not, not so effectively. And, you know, it remains to be seen what will happen, but, but the ultimate goal of it, I mean, the ultimate end of it to me seems to be it similar like to it, the, it had to go in that way. Right. Yeah. Because what else is there? Right. I mean, it was either going to go towards the conservatives or help the, or help the liberals. Was, well, you know, like, you know, like, and like, like the same thing was true of BLM and the anti uh -huh. yeah. uh, George Floyd or the, yeah. you know, the George Floyd murders the, um it was all about, it was either going to give Trump a reason to impose an even more draconian, like law and order regime, or at least run on that. Um, and, and when, or it was going to help the Democrats and, it, you know, so well, you know, it could also have done something else, which is that very Nixonian. Mm. Right. Trump is very Nixonian. Mm. So Trump did use the George Floyd protests as an opportunity to push his criminal justice reform. He did. Mm. As well as, in other words, there's no contradiction between sending the troops out onto the street to, to have law and order and mm. liberalizing uh, criminal sentencing. There's no contradiction there, like whatsoever. It's I, like, re I realize that. Yeah. Right. And so that's obviously what they wanted to do. I mean, they had the Republican National Convention in 2020 was one black person after another testimonials about how the Trump administration had saved them for, by letting them out of jail and giving them a second chance. I mean, it was it was remarkable. Just as there's no contradiction between calling for defunding the police and uh, creating stricter sentencing and putting more people in prison uh, for some things. Yeah. You know, some... or, or, I mean, I'm not saying that that's exactly, well, or I think of Clinton's, you know, like coming out strongly against the racism of the Republicans and the, the neglect of the Bush administration and using that to push welfare reform and entrepreneurialism, uh -huh. and the, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. 
I mean, um, it's it's misery because again, we are we're being subject to and manipulated by capitalist politics all the time, hmm. and you know, in our deepest thoughts and feelings, in our deepest psychology, it's there, and that was the case even before the internet and even before the twenty four hour news cycle. You know, the daily hmm. newspaper is enough to do that, actually. Hmm. Um, and you know, just the, the dominance of the capitalist state is enough to do that. Mm -hmm. And so it's very hard for us to really think about an alternative to that. In other words, how do you organize the working class in a way that is wholly independent of capitalist policy, including mm -hmm. law, including administrative policy. And that's when you get into like the realities, you know, like if you go back to early labor organizing. Early labor organizing did not depend upon the law at all. Like it, it pretty much was a violation of the law. Like mm -hmm. despite the First Amendment, you know, right to free speech, right to assemble, because you're on the private property of the capitalists. And you, that, that does, the First Amendment doesn't protect you. You don't have the right to assemble on someone else's property. You mm -hmm. don't have the right to speak on someone, on someone else's property on the job. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have these things. And so, you know, of course it did. That's why it was subject to severe repression. Mm. Now, what the left has convinced itself of is that somehow the workers won concessions in the kind of legalization of labor organizing, mm -hmm. right? But what that did was it made labor organizing dependent on the capitalist state's permission, mm. which it, sh it, it does not need, should not need, never had, never really will have because it can always be revoked mm -hmm. right so and you know in practice and i always like to point out that really the successes of labor organizing are not at the level of administrative policy or law they're at the level of what the capitalists themselves have to accept on the ground mm -hmm. in concrete social reality which has nothing to do with what the state wants Right. The state I mean, we know that's true because you can have all sorts of labor laws on the books and none of them enforced on the job. Exactly. Totally. Like like everybody deserves a 15 minute break every three hours or something like. Yes. Yeah. Right. Yeah, that doesn't really happen. Right. Uh, uh, right. Really. OK. But 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 um, I want to go back to uh, look, actually, we've been talking for about an hour. So what I should say is, despite myself, what I said at the beginning. I'm going to break this in half. We're going to stay, just stay here though. We're not going to do a second stream, but I'm going to break it here in the second half. Maybe it'll be 30 minutes. Maybe it'll be longer. We should just talk about sublation and, and the partisan review and the Frankfurt school and, and platypus and like what the project was to go from being post-political to pre-political in your mind back in 2015. And maybe how I could pick up remnants of that as we move forward, because we're about to move forward with sublation. And I want to have a, a, a clearer vision as to what we're aiming to do. And I think picking your brain is going to help. So people who want to hear the inside baseball can go to Patreon and pay $5 to hear it.